Welcome to the fourth episode of the podcast Let's Talk. One of the main goals of this project is to introduce a modern educational concepts and schools to professionals and public. This time we will virtually visit a unique place in New Zealand called Green School. I believe you will be pleased to hear about the space in Taranaki region where learners work on hands-on projects connected to natural environment and community. My name is David Ilma and I will guide you through the program in English and Czech. Happy listening! So hello everybody, uh, welcome in this uh, part of our uh, regular meeting on uh, education. Uh, this is podcast uh, Let's Talk and this time we will talk about Green School in New Zealand, which is a very unique school um, compared to actually any other school which I personally visited and uh, you can see around the world. Uh, we have got three guests here today. Uh, the first one uh, is Freddy, second Miro and D. So I will let them introduce themselves and then we will uh, hop on some questions. So if you can tell us uh, your name, uh, what year are in and maybe how long you've been in the school. Um, I'm Freddie and I'm a year seven. I'm 12 years old and I've been at the school for two years since it has opened. Perfect. Hi, I'm Miro. I'm a year seven too. I'm 11 years old and I've been at the school since it opened two years as well. Kia ora koutou. my name's Faya Dai and I'm the heart of school here at Green School New Zealand. I've actually been here for three years now, so while the school was being uh, created, when it was just farmland, I was here during that first build. So I'm one of the founding educators that's been here since 2019. I should probably say that I was uh, slightly involved in a Green School New Zealand as a volunteer for a few months. Um, and so I get the chance to see Green School in New Zealand a little bit at the beginning. And also I knew about Green School concept of the school from Bali when I visited three years ago for a week, uh, the mother of the Green School New Zealand. Um, mm. And yeah, it's pretty unique uh, environment. I think the environment is something what strike people when they visit the school uh, in actually in New Zealand or in Bali. Um, so what do you think are uh, the core values of uh, the Green School philosophy, which is also projected slightly into uh, the environment what school use, I guess? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I guess, David, we educate for sustainability through community integrated and entrepreneurial learning. Uh, in a beautiful natural environment here in New Zealand. Um, I also got to spend some time at Green School Bali uh, before I jumped on the Green School Waka. The, it's a word for boat that we use here. And so like you, I, I went to the school and was just inspired by what I saw in the natural environment. But then also what I got to see in the community and what the learners were doing being so inspired in their classrooms by the teachers being so motivating and inspiring. Um, when Matua Mark and I went over there, we just knew that we wanted to be part of bringing this to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Some of the things that um, I guess the approach is, it's a holistic student guided approach, which inspires and empowers our young people to be green leaders as well. This green school way of learning allows um, our children to kind of thrive by learning in a really purposeful manner. And it's teaching our learners to be change makers and showing them that they can have a positive impact on the world um, and using their own passions to kind of ignite that so they w really want to be at school. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I was um, looking at your website, uh, you've got... Um like sort of summarize your values in there and the skills which you uh, try to teach uh, children in your school. Um, mm. Some of them are sort of unique, but most of them is, um, let's say, common or lots of schools like state schools or private schools stated on their websites or their program, they want to sort of uh, get same skills to their kids as well. Uh, mm. So what do you think uh, is different uh, because I guess, uh, Dee, you have got experience from uh, like state schools or private schools, don't you? Mm. 
Yeah, so what is the difference uh, between the green school and the, let's say the biggest biggest difference between uh, schools and a uh, green school? I guess for me as an educator, it, you're right, there are some similar, the values and also some of the skills are quite similar to what you would see in mainstream schools in the public sector. But I think the difference here is that there's actually a lot of space that is created for example, our green school values. Um, boys, do you can you recite, do you know some of those values that we've got for the I respect? Um, yeah, we've got things like trust, community, sustainability, um, responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like integrity, respect. Yeah, and some of those values, I think because we've created space and we have been, we're lucky enough to kind of create our curriculum, we've developed the Kuru curriculum. And that kind of just provides more space for those values and skills to be taught. That um, coming from the public sector as well, there are just so many um, curriculum areas that you have to cover. And there often wasn't the space to really dive in deep to some of these skills and the values and really put some focus onto it. So that's kind of been quite unique from what I've experienced in education and setting aside, yeah, the space to be able to actually really look at those values and skills closely. Um, and then again, with the skills, seeing that develop into the high school where our learners aren't having to just sit exams or, you know, the testing kind of uh, standardized assessments, these skills are actually embedded into their portfolio so that they can actually be really using these skills and then embedding them into the real world. All right, yeah, that sounds uh, sounds good. Uh, and definitely there is difference compared to some schools. I think uh, what I felt when I was there or visited, um, that it also uh, the approach and general vibe and atmosphere in the schools make difference. Um, the students and actual teachers as well, or visitors even, uh, can like feel uh, this sort of supportive and uh, different uh, approach to this education, like more happiness, let's say. Yeah, I like that. The more happiness is, is beautiful because that is definitely one of the core things that we believe in terms of the relationship building that we do with our learners, with each other and staff. We do spend quite a bit of time even at the start of the year uh, with the team bonding and just getting to know each other. But as well as our community, I know, um, you know, we have a very open community campus where we've actually even created a space called The Bridge where our community, our parents can actually come and either work remotely for here, um, while here, or the workshops that we provide and the opportunities for the community kids to connect and do that relationship building is very important to us. Uh, boys, uh, I wonder uh, what you like um, in your school. And I guess uh, you went to sort of primary school uh, somewhere else, didn't you, before? Um, yeah, so I grew up in Hong Kong okay. in Asia and I was born there. So I was in, well, the skills from here and to Hong Kong are a lot different. So, yeah, there's quite a big difference between them yeah and uh, what do you like uh, in the green school so if you can compare even maybe, maybe what you experienced in hong kong and what you have now here what do you feel is the, the most interesting for you or what do you like um something that i like about here is the freedom that you have that we have lessons called passion and play and we get to choose a passion and like try either make or design what we want to do like me and Miro are making rugby goalposts for the green school community to put up on our field and yeah it just allows you to have freedom with what you want to do in your learning how about you Miro? what do you like um so coming from a, a public school where we had tests and all that stuff like that Green school, as Freddie said, it has a lot more freedom. And like with, if you're doing writing or something like that, at other schools, they kind of give you something to do, but green school, you get to choose. Yeah, that sound, sounds definitely interesting.
what you would suggest as a um, values or maybe the skills uh, which would be uh, easy to implement in any other school? Yeah, I think, like I said earlier, it's about creating the space to actually really dive in deep to investigate those values or the skills. I mean, the like we, the boys shared integrity, responsibility, equity, sustainability, peace, empathy, community and trust. Those are our values and we really dive in and we take those apart. You know, what does it look like in our community? What does it sound like both at school and at home? So it's really providing that space to really dive in and, and understand what it looks like, what it sounds like. Even from our little ones, we have our five-year-olds right through to our high school learners, getting them to actually give sentences on, you know, what does um, peace sound like in your in our classroom or in the playground or if we're out on a school trip? And I think that's the difference. It's providing the space to really teach those skills but also practice and celebrate them. It, yeah, we had a little bit touched that. But uh, I would like to know maybe more a little bit about your day in the school. Uh, boys, if you can tell me how your typical day in Green School New Zealand looks like. Um, in the morning, instead of having a bell, we usually, um, some learners from year three to five, put music on over some intercoms so everyone around the school can hear them and know that it's time to go and start school. And we also have that at... Um, morning teas, our snack times, and our lunch times. Yeah, um, but a normal day we have, it's not normal, <laughs> but we have a lot of like lessons that other schools would have. We have maths, we have literacy, we have um, things like that, but we also have something called Hikoi every Thursday, which is kind of like physical ed or something and you go outside and you do mountain biking or swimming or maybe rat trapping and it's just about being outside and mostly getting fit and when you talk about uh, the lessons pretty uh what is the, the, the lessons like how they are scheduled in the day uh, do you have like math and english in mornings or is it uh, like just normal timetable like in any other schools um, well, usually we have three blocks in the day, mm -hmm. but on some days we have half blocks, which maybe in the morning we might have, like you said, math for like 45 minutes and then literacy for another 45. But um, usual days we have just four blocks of that lesson. And yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the day for teacher? in green school uh the day for the teacher is similar it's quite nice being able to arrive to school set up we do lots of connecting so that relationship building is really important that we connect with our learners that's definitely a thing that our teachers know that it's really important to do just connect first thing before even lessons start is to connect with our learners then as freddie said that beautiful resident dj music comes on and it's kind of like a soft transition into your day and so it's beautiful for everyone we've got lots of people on our staff who are, are quite creative and love the music as well then we go into our sessions and the co-constructing is quite important um the well-being side of things we always open with kuru so kuru is focusing on that well-being so there's specific time at the start and in the middle of the day we, we do our mindfulness practice the whole school stops what they do straight after lunch and spend some time doing that after lunch just to help resettle and reset and at the end of the day there's that little bit of kōru as well just to um, reflect on the day set goals and um, or if it's just another reset to talk about what we're going to try and achieve for the next day but as Freddie said, we do our core proficiencies in the in those morning sessions, um, and then in the afternoons, it just depends. We're, we're lucky enough to have some beautiful subjects where we the kids can be creative and co-construct their lessons. 
So the passion and play has been a really popular um, subject where the kids get to really dive into their interests and passions. And then the HECOI, which is our outdoor education program where the learners are either on campus or accessing our beautiful community, uh, whether it's rock climbing up Paritutu or hiking the Pokai Ranges or whether it's connecting with community agencies and providing support with food bank and um, going into rest homes. We've got two beautiful projects that are happening at the moment within our older learners, and that is their footprints and quest projects. And so the boys have actually just completed their projects last year on footprints, and they could probably speak to, speak to that. So our footprints is like... It's kind of giving back to the community in a way. So we got to choose what we wanted to do or make. And so for my footprints, I did, um, I made t-shirts and, um, and tea towels. And so um yeah so we sold so i sold those and then i gave the money to charity what charity did you choose um the taranaki retreat what they do they help people who ha who aren't in a good place and if they're not very like happy and they're a bit sad and then they can go there and they help them out mm -hmm. and how about the second project um for my project i did an international food festival mm -hmm. and i got this idea from my last school in hong kong and what we did for the food festival was we had different food stands from other nationalities and countries around the world and they would just share their food and you didn't need to pay for the food and there'd be there'd be dancers and it was just a free day of like exploring different cultures and just having fun i guess the footprints in itself it was kind of like a a passion project where the learners were asked to kind of leave behind a positive footprint um, for the community and or the environment. Mm. So last year the boys uh, transitioned because they were year six going into junior high. So it was kind of like even like a rites of passage journey mm. um, that they had gone through. And it was just beautiful to see all of their individual passions come to life. Mero's awesome at designing, which is why he decided to go down that design track and make some awesome t-shirts and tea towels. Mm. And then for the cause, being able to go out to the Taranaki retreat, meet the people who are supporting our Taranaki community with uh, their mental and emotional well-being, and knowing that Miro actually supported, you know, collected the fundraising, and that money went to benefit our community was just beautiful. And then the way Freddie got our whole community together, as well as outside community, to come in and celebrate the international multicultural mm. kind of society that we have here. That was equally so beautiful to see and to see him take the lead. You know, we the teachers don't always have to be at the front leading it. It's beautiful to see our learners taking the lead. And at the moment in term four, at, at this time, that's happening all over campus. So it's kind of exciting. Even this afternoon, we've got Brianna Elder, who's in the diploma. She's organized a color run for the community. So I can't wait to see how that comes together and just have everyone again come together and celebrate, but also have these beautiful community causes in the background, which have um, kind of ignited the passion in our learners. Yeah, I have to absolutely agree. Uh, if uh, you get the learners um, some freedom and, and chance to choose and do what they are passionate about, it's definitely a nice drive and, and the results are uh, usually awesome. Um, you mentioned several times co-construction which I believe is something how you can uh, get exactly voice of students uh, to on, on the learning and on the content of the learning, I, I, I suppose. So uh, can you do a little bit talk, talk about more this, how, how it works and how it's organized? 
Sure, the co-construction side of things. Boys, do you want to talk about how we develop things together? I mean, for an educator, it can be a little bit unsettling because, um, you know, usually you have your unit plans all set out, right? And for the term, you know exactly what you want to do and what you want to achieve. Yet, when you're working with learners in a co-constructing kind of environment, your inquiry, or we call them voyage, can change completely depending on how the learners want to kind of dive into that and explore. So that can be a challenge in itself because you can't be fully um, planned and resourced for for your ideas because the learners are actually taking lead of some of that and it can go on these different, we call them bends. So you might have a couple of weeks focusing on one aspect and then it just changes completely down a different track. And that's okay, it's quite exciting. I think our learners really enjoy that because they then actually take more ownership into their learning because it's something that they have been curious about. All right, boys, uh, can you can you have your view on this co-construction? How do you put together uh, sort of the content of your uh, learning? It's very outdoor-based learning. And yeah, well, a lot of the stuff we do, we try um get it outdoors and try like connect with people from outside of school. Yeah, to do uh, some of our learning, like for our voyage lessons last term, we were connecting with um, a company called Litter Intelligence, and they they go to beaches and they clean up. Well, they clean the beaches up, and then they take data from um, what they've got, and they see like how much plastic there was, how much metal there was, how much wood. And yeah, they do that and they track it all on a website. And yeah, so when we did that with them, we um, put all of our information and all the um, rubbish that we got off the beaches and we put that data onto the website. I think their voyages as well, the themes that we have, David, are quite broad. Um, for example, this year we've had nature down to earth was our term one voyage. Well-being from within was our um, second. In term three, we had economy, which was easy as pie. And then today, uh, this term, it's sustainability. So because they are quite broad topics, it kind of allows each class to explore what those big themes mean and then for them to decide, okay, well, What are we going to look at in sustainability? Are we going to look at community sustainability? What does that look like for us? So it's really providing the learners with some broad topics and then getting them to share. Obviously, it can take a while when you do have to make some decisions because there could be just an endless amount of topics that they want to explore. But it's being able to sort through, talk about it, what's achievable, what could we do here, what stands out, and then just working together as making a plan on how to move forward. Yeah, I think uh, what might be very interesting for uh, many people and many teachers, because D, you mentioned it can be intimidating uh, to um, like let it go and, and, and open the plans for the learners. Uh, I wonder how practically it's organized. Do you have some sessions at the beginning of term when you like discuss it or do you have like longer periods of time? Um, and I wonder as well, uh, Freddie and Myra, what, what are your sort of uh, how, how you approach teachers? If you like uh, talk to them and you're giving them your ideas or you are picking up something what the teachers come up with? Hmm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start off and just share that. Yes, we definitely do have planning so we have our planning kind of co-construction meetings, our hui together as staff, and then we break into our neighbourhood sessions where we also kind of figure out what could we be doing in this voyage as a whole school, some common activities that might be even possible. We'll talk about our end of term. Usually there's always this, some type of end of term celebration. And then from there in our neighbourhoods, so in our teams, we talk about some possibilities And then from there, it's going back to the classroom. And like I said, we share with the learners the overall theme and get them to pull out any ideas that they have. 
Where's how, how long actually this takes? Uh, is it like for a week or longer? Yeah, it can take. Well, the teachers, we have a planning session at the end of the term. So at the moment now, uh, we're in week six, I think it is. So we're already just starting to think about what's going to happen for term one next year. Um, and we will kind of come together during our planning week and our callback week to have those initial ideas. When it happens in the classroom, so for example, at the beginning of this term, um, we would introduce it in that first week and it can take a whole first week for actually that co-construction to happen with the learners where they're writing down their ideas um, or sharing them out loud. We've had to really talk to our learners about having brave, open and honest conversations as well. And that has taken some time because we really want to capture everyone's voice. And sometimes um, the learners don't feel so confident in sharing their ideas on what they would really like to look into. So we kind of try to provide different opportunities for, the, for them to capture their voice, whether it's written or if it's shared, um, and just make sure that everyone has um, a voice and sharing on, on what they might like to explore. But yeah, it definitely takes a lot of time. And again, David, I think that's why Green School is so special, where we don't have those constrictions on, you know, you have to complete this then and there. Um, we've got the time to actually create the space for the learning and ideas, that ideas station to happen within the week. And then obviously we have some targets. Okay, this week we've done our brainstorming and collected everyone's ideas. Now we need to move, move into the next phase. So if I understand, uh, just uh, you sort of schedule and have got targeted rather the phases of uh, each sort of part of project and the, the kids will come up with uh, the content for the project. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we kind of decide whether it's possible because there could be some really out of the box kind of ideas and we have to talk to the learners openly and honestly as well about if that's even achievable. If there are ways around it, we will always try to support. So uh, there's lots of mentoring around um, what we do. So if we can't provide something ourselves and the kids really want to dive into this, we will try and um, provide or pull in community, outsource our um, outside agencies and community to see if they can help support some of their um, inquiry. Freddie and, and Myra, how, how do you feel about this uh, time when you need to come up with the ideas? Do you have your own ideas, uh, like uh, which you want to do, or are you picking up something, or you just like long, longer discussion with your teachers? Sometimes I get ideas about what the term could be, but they're usually not crazy big ideas, just like pretty basic ideas and who came up with the idea uh or the rugby uh rugby pitch for what you're doing now um well um for passion and play me and mira are working together to make the rugby goal posts to put up on the field so yeah um we both kind of came up with that idea and we're both interested in rugby and we really want to get some goal posts up that's perfect. So if we want to come, like, maybe bring, like, a rugby tee to school and just kick some balls over and stuff, then we can. But it also just makes it more fun and maybe sort of more realistic. And, yeah, so that's why we decided to do that. It's kind of cool having the campus so bare, I guess, at the moment because, um, you know, if you are in different schools, all of that would be already set up. But the fact that our learners can create the rugby posts or create um, the mountain bike track that's happening uh, then there's just the sense of ownership and um, you kind of take more pride knowing that you've actually created it yeah absolutely agree i think it's one of the key elements uh, which we are missing in most of the schools it's to have the ownership of some space in the school because uh, it's triggered naturally it's not like like fault of someone it's just like naturally people like grab more responsibility for the place if they know i made this and i don't want to make it break or i want to maintain this and keep it going and i think mm -hmm. the rugby field is a good idea boys because you will build this and then someone can add new stuff into it and it can develop and, and stay and people can start playing more rugby and and it might be like good fun as you said mm. One of 
the key elements of Green School program is uh, sustainability and sort of ecology and this sort of green thinking. Um, we had uh, recently a big uh, international event, uh, which might be a disappointment for someone. Uh, it's called COP26. Uh, and it was the big UN conference about uh, uh, climate change. Um, and I would like to know uh, how Greens who implement uh, sort of uh, the green thinking and the sustainability in, in the program so that actually the learners can uh, start um, bringing um, their own ideas and then they push their sort of view uh, outside of the school as well. So what do you do in this, this field? I'll let the boys share some of the uh, learning that went on with that conference. But I guess even the language that we're using in terms of our primary learners are called the guardians of the earth um, as they move up. Um, the kind of the names for the neighbourhood reflect the impact that we want them to have. We talk, we spend a lot of time being talking about kaitiaki. So kaitiaki o te whenua is a Māori word for saying the guardians of the land so what does that look like you know what do we do we've got we've got the wonderful matua tobias who that you um we're working with david and our learners see him every week and learn from him and his expertise with the kind of like the green study side of things um we pull in we have the beautiful enviro skills community as well who come in and run workshops for our learners We've also got a learner-led initiative that's happening at the moment where we're getting our green leaders from each school around Taranaki to actually start networking together because they know that they can have more impact and learn from each other. So there are some wonderful things happening in terms of the sustainability side of things. I think also for us, sustainability although it's very important for the environmental sustainability, the community sustainability is equally as important. And so we make sure that we really utilise and connect with our um, community within Green School. Uh, we've got some amazing parents that with their expertise and skills that we try to use, and then also our wider community. Boys, did you want to talk about the COP26 stuff that you were doing, that your well, class did? We did learn about COP26 and all about how it's trying to support climate change. And, um, well, we kind of learnt about um, a New Zealand young speaker who was there. And, yeah, she was speaking, like, on her behalf of, like, New Zealand, I think. Mm. We yeah. also connected with Green School Bali. Yeah. Uh, because they're also, their leaders, they've been doing this for the last 10 years. And so it was quite nice to actually take, for them to take the lead and we were invited to one of their assemblies that they hosted during that week um, and actually learnt to see what they were doing for the green school community in the world and, and them sharing their knowledge with us which was really good because we're still on our you know we're our second year in and we're still on the journey so it's really nice that we can learn from our sister school green school Bali and really take on some of those initiatives and, and just see how the uh, student advocacy is happening over there and, and what we can inspire to, to be as well. Is there something in your curriculum what would introduce this? Because, uh, you know, lots of schools wouldn't have be that lucky to have nice open green site uh, where they can grow. Um, oh, maybe it's just like excuse because you can grow vegetable um, some probably everywhere. But um, yeah, if there's something what uh, other schools um, without the big grounds uh, can try introduce, do you have some tips? Well, something that we do a lot is the gardening here. And we have planting days where we plant native trees. Mm. Um, yeah, and gardening's a big one. Yeah, that's an easy one for other schools to do. And in New Zealand, I think we're lucky there's a big government initiative as well. Um, with the planting so anyone can actually do the planting we're lucky enough to have this big beautiful campus but you could be doing the planting wherever in your own space um, a lot of schools already do their community gardens which is wonderful we've taken it a little step further and decided that we want to kind of continue that keep looking after it and and then also collect the produce 
to share with our community. So that's been a, a kind of an added thing that we've enjoyed in our community. We've actually really enjoyed being able to now um, purchase the the produce that we've been able to make in our in our mara, in our garden, and in the tropo house. Boys, do you like gardening? Yeah. 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 We. It's fun because usually we just go out with a shovel and we like. Most of the school goes to one area of the um, campus and we all just plant as many trees as we can there. And, yeah, it's just a really, it's really fun and it's sustainable. Not, it's not fun for everyone, though, David. Like, we acknowledge that some of our kids have got no interest in, in gardening and um, although there are opportunities for them to actually step up into those leadership roles, we still talk to the learners about that importance of manaki, caring for your la- for the land. And so we go out and do the community planting or we do the weed stomping. And everyone does that because they know that's what we do in terms of our tikanga, our practice, um, and caring for our environment because we need to look after our environment that we're here <clears throat> in. But, yeah, we acknowledge that it's definitely not um, a passion for everyone yet it's really cool that we have got a handful of learners who want to really step into that kind of environmental sustainability role and kind of take the lead for us and then guide us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, exactly. I agree because gardening is something for definitely um, not for everyone, especially in the age of uh, like 13, 14, 15. Um, uh, it's something what people probably will not find uh, that fun. But I agree, planting trees is definitely good fun. And you can feel when you plant the trees, you made something for your environment around you. It's definitely a good feeling. I agree with that. Totally. The trapping's been a real good one as well, because often we've got a big trap line. And even being able to inform the community about the importance of, um, you know, training the your dogs at home. We've just had a workshop that the iwi put on around that and, just the, the rodents and the protecting the bird life around here. The, our primary learners have just really enjoyed the bird of the year kind of um, focus that has been happening. So it's kind of pushing a lot of awareness. It doesn't just have to be about the physical environment. It can be about our beautiful wildlife as well. Uh, boys, I wonder if it's something what you sort of don't like uh, in the school because you know everyone are different. Um, everyone needs to deal with the situation when we don't need to, we, we don't want to do something, or we don't like something. Uh, but uh, is there something uh, what you find not good for you um, in your school, and how you deal with the situation like that? Well, it happens in like most schools around the world, but. Sometimes people can get annoying and you might just kind of in that day lose friendship with them and we just deal with it by we just have time to ourselves and like in the end of the day everyone's friends with each other again because well you just reflect on what you think happened and it can help you with that like argument or something you had. We use a thing called restorative practice, David, in terms of our behavior management and um, try to teach our learners how to use that restorative conversation kind of strategy, um, both in school. So if things happen in the playground or in the classroom, um, even at home, we've ended up having two of our learners read um, and Toby who was here take lead in that and provide some training in our assemblies and teach the community about what a restorative conversation is and how you really look at what's been happening, what happened in the situation, who was impacted, um, ways of exploring the harm and then also ways we can move forward. And it's quite nice having the learners actually be part of that conversation and they determine, you know, how... The, re- the relationship is repaired and how you can move on rather than it coming again from just the adult or the teacher or staff member. Um, it's put back onto the learners. Uh, yeah, Freddie, you mentioned that you reflect on the situation. Uh, 
what happened if uh, um, if something like that happened? What is the things how you what, what do you do in this situation? So that like uh, are you seeking some help from adults or teachers or do you do something else? What do you maybe learn from uh, the restorative uh, session? Well, it helps you reflect on what has happened and it can make you feel more calm and that can just help you with like forgetting most of the stuff that's happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have experience from the other side? Because this is a little bit like experience when you are the victim of someone. But if you do something wrong, how you would uh, deal with this situation? I'm not supposed that I'm not like assume that you like doing something like that. I just like think you can have some sort of um, recipe how to how to sort this situation out if you did something wrong and you know it was wrong. Well, if it was an accident, we're always taught to just say straight away are you okay and to help them out with whatever they need but well it's usually not on purpose things that happen but um they how how often you need to deal with some situations like which are attached to behavior sort of um yeah behavior situation hmm. um it can happen often i guess being on a campus where we haven't got um lots of things set up in terms of you know, Freddie, the boys are doing their rugby posts and, you know, with the with resources as well, we haven't got all of those things just yet. So sometimes if the kids are bored, they can't, these little arguments or things can pop up in the playground or in the classroom, which is um, we acknowledge and we just work through it together. So it's just making sure that we've got systems in place like the restoratives um, or going into the classrooms and talking to them about the problem-solving approach and ways that they can kind of try to deal with issues or challenges themselves. And if they can't, then coming to see the adult or the person on staff that could support them with that. So it's making sure the learners really know that there's lots of supports available. Um, and when some things do happen with behaviour things, there's always a reset so we talk about, like I said, in that restorative practice, you really look at what harm was caused, who who was affected, and that allows the person doing um, the behaviour um, to reflect on how that affected the person that they did it to. But it also gives the person that it happened to um, the chance to hear why that happened, because maybe the, that person was doing some things to kind of create the you know the function of behavior so it's really nice being able to create the space for both sides to be shared in front of each other and to really make sense of that and then find ways of moving forward so it definitely you know um happens within the playground within the classroom and we're just lucky enough i think to have the staff um but both mark and i uh, come from a behavior specialist background we were resource teachers of learning and behaviour. So we've been able to bring in uh, lots of our strategies and ideas and professional learning to share with our staff. Um, and that's what we've based some of our practice on with that positive behaviour for learning model. It might be actually uh, good to add uh, how many learners and how many teachers do you have in Green School New Zealand? We started with 53 last year learners. I think we're at 72 at the moment with our learners. And then with our staff, we've got about 15 staff um, present and with the actual teaching staff, I think we've got around nine, I think it is now. Let's look at the future. Um, I know uh, Green School New Zealand is developing quite rapidly. Uh, there's new building site uh, where you are actually constructing completely new part of the campus. Um, so, uh, where, boys, what do you wish to have in, in the school, uh, let's say, in following two, three years, where you will be there? Well, um, I kind of wish to have more students, which we will get, but that's what I'm kind of hoping for at the moment. And... Also, oh yeah, and once our um, goalpost goes up, 
and also like more more activities to do at lunch times and morning teas. And it means like have the equipment for the activities or yeah, the equipment and 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 more kids as well. I see. Yeah, so you won't have more more friends around you, so you have a little more fun. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um. Yeah. And, and um, second second opinion. Well, definitely having more, um, like teachers and students here will, um, be good, because I think once we get more students things will start making more shape in that and um uh obviously the rugby goalposts <laughs> and of everyone's passion projects to be done because that'll be really cool to have um a water slide would be really good but <laughs> at the moment that'll be a bit hard to have and yeah um the construction sites like all the buildings that are getting put up, like a building called the Kinner, which is like a sea urchin like shaped donut sort of thing that's being put up now. And it's like a inside of that there's gonna be a couple classrooms. So it'll be really good to have those for next year. The extra spaces. Yeah, trampolines are very good as well. Do you have trampoline in your school? Um, we don't, but that would be another really cool thing to have. Yeah, they're definitely popular, yeah. I think the numbers are quite a good point. Uh, I worked in England in small school, uh, but we had like just uh, 70, 80 students as well. And it was sort of the minimum where the people can find good friends uh, in, in the group or the like, year group. Um, and I think yeah, it's definitely have around 100, 120 students is my opinion, the ideal number when you have like enough students and enough chance to find friends. How it looks like the construction side and where you are seeing your the future of the green school in two years? Yeah, like the boys said, I'm really looking forward to seeing more learners on campus, more teachers, just more people. And that's going to be really exciting. And when borders open, hopefully we can have a few more internationals as well come and enjoy um, the campus. I'd love to be able to see this development of student advocacy within the um, within the campus as well with the learners. We're just starting to talk about that in quarter and in our lessons, and it's kind of going to be exciting to see how we will have these pockets of learners really passionate about their um, interests and want to kind of take ownership and, and for them to really take lead. At the moment, we're doing lots of facilitating and, and mentoring, but it's going to be nice to see this really come to life in the next few years. And how about the new building side? What what will be in there? Apart the classroom, if Freddie mentioned, uh, what yeah, is the main so purpose it's, of it? It's a, it's a really exciting because that's where our primary um, learners will slowly move over into. And then we also have the iHub. So in that area, that's where we will have some of our technologies, art, bigger art workshop spaces, um, so our science labs, what else is happening over there, guys? Oh, the gym. The gym. Yeah, so all of those things that learners are just patiently waiting for, um, we can't wait to, to see. And it's amazing just seeing how quickly the structures are, are popping up around us. And even the, with the, the landscape, David, I bet if you saw some of it now, you'd just be so amazed to see how quick the plants have grown and how the, the waka are looking just surrounded by this beautiful campus yeah i would wish to visit again it has been a while when i was there it's like maybe a year now over mm. there so it will be different i guess um yeah that's that sounds like a good plans i think i hope boys that something will come up definitely soon for you um do you have uh, this last usually what i do last last part of uh, this uh, short talks uh is um to give some message uh from you to other people um, so do you, would you like to say some message to, you know, imagine just the normal state school or normal schools in, in the new Plymouth, let's say, um, and if you have got some message, which you would say to, uh, some teachers or maybe students in the school, um, what they would, they should hear, hear from you. Maybe for like, 
other schools to encourage them to get their students out more um, and, and do their, like, passions. Good. Definitely um, follow, like, your passions and let students have a bit more choice, like always having fun in all the lessons that you do. How about you, Dee? What do you would send as a message? A message, I would say, be kind, um, be brave, be open, and uh, care, care for the land, care for the people. Perfect. Thank you. I think it's perfect uh, finish of our short talk. Uh, so I have to thank you for your time, guys. It's uh, lovely to hear from you and and uh, have your view on on education and and introduce the green school uh, to. Our little listeners community um, so uh, thank you for that thank you for your time and I wish you uh, the best for your future and and for the development on a green school awesome thanks David thank you so much thanks for having us thank, thank you. you that's all for today I believe we have introduced some interesting practical ideas and concepts which you might try implement in your school or classroom I am sure that even small steps towards freedom in learning can have positive impact on your students. If you have enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with your friends or visit my website homeschoolonline.network. Thank you for your time and see you next time.